Tell me when we're getting close and we're running out of cord. Okay, we're just about, about there. There. Does that got do better? If, the problem with if the camera could be like this, we would be set. I don't know how to get the camera to move yeah. and stay there. Because there's a the directional would be there, and it's uh-huh. not there. <laughs> oh my goodness. That might work. Oh, I think you might you should say that. Let's see. I could maybe sit over here. Starting in a few minutes. The doctors have been nice enough, they're more technically minded than I thought. <laughs> we're surprising. Which is great. So we're going to let them have another minute to, uh, to come in. Everybody, thank you. If you could sign in and, and take one of the survey forms and give it to me at the end. And we'll be setting up in a minute. I'm going to start the presentation, uh, the introductions, pretty easily, very quickly, um, and then anybody else that comes in, um, will take it from there. So, first of all, good morning, and thank you for joining us here at John Hopkins Hospital. We appreciate all the help that they've had in, in planning this program. My name is Joe Buffon. I'm the chapter manager at the Threat Association of America. The TAA is very proud to be in a partnership with the Centers of disease control and prevention, through which we work to provide education programs to professionals, families, and develop resources that address medical and education mm-hmm. needs. We've had these programs in all 50 states. This program is being live streamed so that families can tune in across the country and welcome all of them who are tuning in right now. And we welcome everybody that had the ability to come today. The CDC has asked that we have everyone who attends the program fill out a survey in order to find out if, if you felt that the program was educational. This also helps us plan out topics for the following year. 
So when you get a chance, at the end of this, please give me those surveys, and if there's any questions, um, I would try to help answer those. For those that are participating at home uh, via live stream, you will also please fill out the evaluation by using the survey monkey link that will be provided. So, there are two introductions. The first, real quick, I want to make to the chapter chair uh, from the Mid-Atlantic chapter, uh, Michelle Gutten. Um, and she's going to give you a little overview of what the uh, great work chapter does, and then we'll go into the program. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I've met everyone already, because I'm at Pace but for those who are yeah. listening at home, uh, I am the chair of Mid-Atlantic chapter of the Tourette Association, and that encompasses all of Virginia, Maryland, and the Washington, D.C. area. So we got a wide range there. Um, but we're happy to have those of you from outside that area as well. Uh, contact us, and we'll help you get the connection you need if we can. Um, one of the things that we do is, uh, primary things that we do, is um, support families. So we can do that one-on-one. -on -one. We can do that through support groups. We also do a lot of education, both in the school and with other um, services. Mm -hmm. We've done police education. We've done uh, school education. Uh, one of my favorite activities for our chapter is that we have youth ambassadors. There are three of them here today. And uh, Davis, do you want to just tell people what you do as a youth ambassador? Because I know Alexander in particular is very interested in that. Yeah. Um, so as a youth ambassador, um, I go, I, well, I haven't done so yet, but I will go into like schools normally, um, and I'll give presentations and I'll spread awareness about Tourette syndrome, um, normally to kids my age or younger. Uh, and also, um, um, yeah. And we also provide a buddy system, so if there's anyone out there with a child who's younger, particularly newly diagnosed, who needs a friend or someone who understands them, these guys, if you have any other like them, would be happy to, uh, to work with you and uh, support them. So please get in contact with us if you need anything at all in this area. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay, what we're going to do, um, Dr. Mann, you might want to position it I'm going to introduce our speaker today. His name is Dr. Matt Speck. Um, and he has a whole list of accreditations and wonderful things that he do. And he told me that I don't have to repeat them all. It will be easier. So uh, take my word for it. He is a, a, a specialist in the field with a lot of accreditation. He'll, he'll go over a little bit himself. So I will hand it off to Dr. Matt Speck. He'll take it from here. And I, I thank you for your attendance and your uh, patience. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome and thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm going to be talking about anxiety disorders in the context of Tourette's syndrome. I have a couple little bits of business to do here, so I uh, have received grant funding from the Tourette's uh, Association of America as well as uh, some uh, 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 fees for uh, speaking at various engagements. And so some of the information I'm going to be providing today has actually um, uh, been supported by the Trent Association of America. We're very thankful for that, um, but we always need to make sure that everybody knows about uh, uh, the various uh, commitments that we have um, to our partners. Uh, so the learning objectives today are to understand the basics of Tourette's syndrome, understand the available treatment options for Tourette's, understand the influence of psychiatric comorbid conditions, particularly anxiety disorders, uh, and understand the treatment of anxiety disorders um, in the context of uh, co-occurring uh, Tourette's syndrome, and how cognitive behavioral therapies in parents are really important uh, to uh, uh, successful uh, treatment of psychiatric comorbidity, primarily anxiety disorders, uh, in children with Tourette's. Um, another little bit of a disclosure, um, you might ask, well, why is a person who has some expertise in Tourette's talking about anxiety uh, disorders? Um, and actually, uh, I, I uh, uh, recently um, uh, accepted a position uh, at Wild Cornell Medical College in New York Presbyterian Hospital in the Youth Anxiety Center as a Tourette specialist, specialist, and people would ask me, well, what? Uh, why, you know, why should we uh, bring you up here uh, to the Youth Anxiety Center? And the truth of the matter is, is, although if you look at my CV, my curriculum vita, you'll see that I have a lot of um, uh, publications and chapters that I've written regarding threats. Um, but, but more so, uh, I, I often treat uh, anxiety disorders uh, in, in these children. You'll, you'll, you'll see why as we 
uh, go through this presentation today. Um, so just briefly, the diagnostic criteria for Tourette's uh, disorder, and this is very similar for chronic or persistent motor vocal disorder as well. Uh, for Tourette's, we have both sounds, uh, 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 ticks as well as motor ticks uh, that happen on a very regular basis and have lasted for at least a year, an onset before the age of 18 uh, years, although there are some uh, uh, folks who have adult onset, although that's, that's much more rare. Uh, we, we always have to make sure that this is not due to a physiological um, uh, uh, effects of a substance uh, or other medical condition. I'll be talking about a lot of people have questions about psychostimulants uh, and, the, and the possibility that they may affect tick or, or, or worsen ticks. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but so these are the basic diagnostic criteria, and they remain pretty stable uh, from DSM uh, 4, uh, the text revision, to DSM 5. By the way, please feel free to ask questions if you have any. I'm sure that uh, the folks that are live streaming will at various times think to themselves, I wish you would address this, so you can uh, help me by uh, uh, making sure to ask some questions. So this is uh, uh, Dr. Tourette, who's a French neurologist. Now, he did not have ticks. This is the work of a very uh, creative uh, research assistant, not, not one of mine. I believe this was at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, with uh, Dr. Doug Woods, uh, uh, who, who uh, gave Tourette some ticks. But as you see, this is a good de demonstration of some of the ticks that we more commonly see here, raising the eyebrows, winking, blinking, squinting, face movements, head nodding, uh, and shoulder uh, shrugs. I think this at one point had some uh, audio file that was associated with it that had some sniffing along uh, with it. was a good demonstration of uh, vocal tics. Of course, there are other common vocal tics like throat clearing, uh, coughing, grunting, those types of noises. Um, of course, we know, we, we know that now that tics are not rare, although one time people uh, believed them to be quite rare. We think they affect about 1% of the population in such a way that it can, be, can cause some uh, co-occurring uh, uh, problems. Um, if, if you look at ch uh, school age kids, um, so for example, my son is eight years old. If you go to his classroom, his now, let's see, he's going to the second grade classroom, you'll see all sorts of kids, maybe as many as 25% of kids, who display uh, behaviors that look very tick-like. Um, the good thing is that most, most kids grow out of them. So as they get older, uh, these kind of movements and or vocalizations start to fade, and it's only about 1% of the population that go on to have a more persistent uh, course. And, and of course, that, uh, you know, is generally pretty mild uh, and remitting. In other words, it goes away with age. Um, but uh, 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 certainly, they, there can be some problems associated with uh, ticks. Generally, it's much more of a, a masculine condition than, than feminine probably about four to five to one male-female ratio. And we've had some studies that have demonstrated that this condition is consistent across cultures uh, and, and various countries. Early onset is the norm. Usually we see ticks emerging around five to seven years of age. And the way I think about the, uh, the ticks in my clinic is that uh, ticks can be a little bit of a canary in the coal mine. Now remember, while most ticks, most ticks, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but most ticks are... Uh, what I would consider to be cosmetic. In other words, they don't cause a whole lot of problems. Um, they are some of the earliest symptoms that we see, and we know that kids that have ticks ha have a tendency to have uh, psychiatric comorbidities develop later. One of the other common early uh, uh, diagnoses that children receive is, of course, ADHD around about the same time frame, and that can actually create a fair amount of confusion uh, for uh, clinicians and parents and even the child and uh, and, and teachers as well. Uh, so just keep in mind, five to seven years is a typical onset, although there are some folks that have a bit later onset. Uh, this is the basic circuit, circuitry, and it's very complicated. Um, and I like to kind of explain this to people in as simple a terms as I can, because that's how I understand things best. Uh, Essentially, what we think happens is that, there, you know, for, for all of us, there's, there's always a lot of information that's coming from the cortex and going into a clearinghouse of sorts, and, and uh, in this case, the basal ganglia, which is a group of structures in the mid midbrain. And the basal ganglia look, works a little bit like a gas pedal and a brake pedal, okay? And one of the things that we think happens is when all this information 
that this motoric information from sensory uh, motor and motor areas is being put into this clearinghouse to decide which movements to to engage in and which ones we uh, are superfluous or unnecessary. Uh, if there's too much gas or too little brake or some combination of the two, we get these overflow behaviors, which we you know, we 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 uh, we think of as uh, uh, ticks. Um, um, and then another issue is that the way, usually for a lot of people, and I've had some patients have described this to me, the way that they experience ticks, at least initially, is that it is, uh, it, it's not an error. So if a person has a tick in this aberrant movement or vocalization, the way the brain interprets it, we think, is not as an error, something went wrong, it's actually something good happened. In fact, I've had some patients of more verbally articulate patients say, I feel like I get a little bit of a a burst of dopamine when I have ticks, meaning I get some sort of a positive uh, uh, valence uh, 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 feeling when I have a tick. Um, of, course, of course, the other issue is when, when people have ticks, it will eliminate, most people will say it eliminates some degree of discomfort. And this is a negative reinforcement cycle. So they can be probably both positively reinforced, meaning there's something uh, the brain interprets as a, a correct uh, 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 engagement of a movement or vocalization, but also on other in other times it could be that it alleviates some unpleasant feeling that that uh, precedes it. We'll talk more about it. any questions. No. So uh, as I mentioned before, generally I, I like to think of ticks as uh, most ticks as being uh, largely cosmetic, um, and ticks uh, tend to peak during the ten to about fourteen fifteen. Uh, years uh, age range, uh, and then they tend to decline over time without any treatment whatsoever. And so for folks that have just ticks, we expect that they're going to have an early onset, a relatively mild and remitting course that might not require treatment at all. And uh, I think uh, recently with some CDC data from 2010, I estimated that there's probably about <coughs> six or 7,000 uh, uh, kids in this uh, most severe time frame in Maryland alone. And we certainly don't see all those kids because, by and large, those, their ticks don't cause a whole lot of problems. <coughs> so this issue uh, that I just mentioned before where, where, where people will describe that I get this unpleasant feeling that, that sometimes precipitates ticks or, or makes me feel like I have to perform a tick in order to, or to alleviate this unpleasant sensory experience, these sensory experiences we call premonitory urges. And uh, when, when a person engages in a behavior and it eliminates an unpleasant feeling uh, or, or, or unpleasant, uh, some, some unpleasant um, aspect of the environment, it can be very reinforcing. So, you know, you think about, uh, you know, um, uh, parents use this, and we'll talk a little bit about, the, uh, about this a little bit later, but parents uh, sometimes use what they call reminders, in which kids call nagging. Uh, to get uh, to get uh, children to you know clean up their room, I'm going to pester you until you pick up your things, and then I will stop. So I, I'm creating an aversive uh, uh, environment until you uh, comply, and then I will stop. Now that's not the best parenting approach, but we all have a tendency to do that as parents. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing here. If I get a funny feeling in my arm and in my wrist, and I do this and that funny feeling goes away, even for a short period of time, then, then it's going to be more likely to occur subsequently. Is this making sense? Okay. Now, by the way, we don't really know exactly what premonitory urges are. Uh, I, I have a tendency to think about them as being very similar to, uh, in all the discussions I've had with patients about their experiences as being very similar to somatic obsessions. Now, this is not to say that this is OCD, but it, but it's a hyper focus on these sensory experiences. Uh, I think that these sensory experiences are probably more likely to happen for people that have ticks, uh, and and over time they can become hyper focused on those sensations. So, just imagine, for example, uh, as I mentioned, most ticks are. Are, are cosmetic, we think, but some of them are can be very uh, severe and can actually um, be quite alarming. For example, some folks have a head and, and neck tick where they thrust their head back, and they can do it with such vehemence that it actually makes me a little bit nauseous to see them do it, because I just imagine if I were to do that myself, how badly that would hurt. 
And we've had some folks, I, I'm thinking of a young lady, uh, who mentioned to me that she went to the emergency department after having done the, this head thrusting tick quite a lot, and they thought she had been in an accident and that she had some sort of head trauma and didn't recognize it because she said, well, and said, well, I'm having this neck pain because I have these head and neck ticks, and they said, you couldn't have possibly caused this much damage by thrusting your own head backward. You must have been in a rear end uh, accident that uh, it has given you whiplash, right? So, but what happens when people thrust their head back or even thrust their arms to the side, I can still feel kind of a funny feeling in my elbow and in my wrist as a result of having done that. So I might have this behavior, behavior happen for no apparent reason, but then what happens is it gets a little, I get a little bit of a funny feeling here, and I might become hyper-focused on that funny feeling, and now I'm distracted from the most important things that are going on in my environment and much more focused on this, and then it's very hard to resist the temptation to do something, that behavior again, because there's an immediate benefit. That feeling goes away. And I ask patients all the time, I say, go, so that, oh, that's good, it works. It goes away forever. And they say, no, it just keeps coming back, and it comes back more and more often. Here are the typical locations of premonitory urges, and we assume that ticks generally follow uh, this pattern in terms of their distri distribution. The darker period are, are portions of this uh, anatomical representation uh, show uh, 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 areas on the body where people uh, report a greater frequency of premonitory urges. And so you'll see the shoulders, the eyes, uh, the hands, uh, the thighs, and some in the abdominal area. For a very long time, we thought of Tourette's as being a largely genetic and biological condition. And the, the influence of the environment in the, in the ways that I uh, was just describing with respect to the, uh, the cycle of engaging in ticks, uh, uh, strange sensory experiences, hyper becoming hyper-focused on them and performing the same kind of behavior even more frequently as a result of the behavior, was, was largely ignored. We thought of it as a genetic biological condition, and this was in part due to the fact that we had medications uh, uh, neuroleptics or antipsychotic medications, uh, th th those are synonymous terms, that were helpful in reducing ticks. Uh, so there were, there were a couple uh, 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 doctors in, in New York, uh, 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 Dr. Shapiro, who found that Haldol was effective in reducing uh, the frequency of ticks, and people actually reported uh, less intense premonitory urges, and so for a very long time these medications were used uh, as the primary treatment uh, for Tourette's. Uh, syndrome. We know that there are various neurotransmitters on which these medications work. The, the one that has received the most attention is dopamine. Uh, and uh, dopamine is involved in movement, uh, excess dopamine, excess movement. Uh, antipsychotic medications uh, actually uh, um, uh, limit uh, the amount of uh, dopamine uh, available uh, in uh, one's brain and then we have less movement. So the problem with it is there's lots of side effects associated with these, uh, these uh, neuroleptics or antipsychotic medications. So they do have better efficacy, but they have more side effects, and some of these are irreversible, and the one we worry most about is tardive dyskinesia, which is a movement condition all in a, of its uh, own. And this is a condition that can be irreversible if you're on high-dose neuroleptics for a long period of time. Yes? Are all of those treatments or medicines, whatever they are, are they still active? So like, I know when I was younger, um, I took ORAP, but I don't know if that's still out there or... Yeah, the, these medications are, are, yes, they're still available. Now, now the, the thing that has been uh, very, very uh, good to see is that when I started, with, so we did the CBIT study in about 2006 through 2008. We published the results in 2010. Um, in that period of time, when I developed, uh, started developing a clinic at Johns Hopkins, um, we saw little kids <coughs> on resveratrol. So these would be uh, typically we would we, we would see, which was very alarming, seven-year-olds uh, who also had co-occurring ADHD, um, and so they're very hyperactive. And I like to think about them as being very energetic and creative. And uh, they would go and see um, a, uh, either a neurologist or a psychiatrist. And, uh, you know, if these 
uh, these uh, um, uh, these kind of this, this motor hyperactivity and impulsivity was a problem enough, and the tics were severe enough. Um, then there was a there was a point at which people would um, prescribe things like risperidone, even these little kids, because it would uh, it would slow uh, the child down. So they would have fewer tics, they were less hyperactive, they were less impulsive, and and this seemed like a good medication. Um, however, because of these side effects, I'm very glad to see that this this practice, at least how, how I've um, experienced it in the last couple of years, has has largely ceased. And so nowadays, people are very very uh, leery of using these tier two medications, in part because we now have a behavioral treatment, and we have these tier one medications like clonidine and guanfazine, which are more commonly prescribed because they don't have as severe side effects. Now they they might not be as effective for ticks, uh, but uh, they do have uh, some efficacy, uh, and they're relatively safe, and kids tolerate them well. People did not tolerate these medications very well. Yes? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about treating ticks or the ADHD? So great question. So guanfazine is the medication that's uh, uh, more often used if kids have ticks and co-occurring uh, ADHD symptoms. Uh, clonidine we'll see more often in kids who have just yet. And and the ADHD that they, that they have, um, how do you, you teach them whether, whether it's a matter of suppressing tics and therefore not being able to pay attention, or ADHD oh. unto itself, which is, yeah. which you know, how do you tease that apart? This is a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> question. Thank you for, for asking that question. Uh, so, so one of the things that people have asked me all along is, and now people are much more savvy about how the behavioral treatment for tics works. And then we teach people to manage their tics by doing something very active in, in place of their tics. Um, and while I, I, I do believe that initially when people are learning how to use these strategies, so if I get a funny feeling here and here and this is my tic, we might teach a child to compete. That's a very good computer response you're doing right there. We might teach a child to do something like this instead. right? And people would ask us, they would say, okay, so he's, he's not ticking anymore, but... But can he do anything else? And I, I didn't bring the video today, but I have a very wonderful video of a, of a young man who had a very loud vocal tick uh, <laughs> that included coprolalia. Now, he, he would uh, had some swear words in his uh, very loud vocalizations, but he kind of tried to muffle them so they weren't so problematic for him. Uh, and we taught him a strategy, uh, usually for vocal ticks. It's a diaphragmatic breathing strategy, so you're moving your diaphragm in a way that's inconsistent with rapid inhalation or exhalation of air uh, into your airways, so you have to do that to make a loud noise, and so we would teach him to breathe in a certain way, move his diaphragm in a slow, rhythmic way, and his tics in the video that I have kind of disappear. And people said, well, he couldn't do anything else while he's doing this, and uh, we then, of course, made a video where he was sitting with my research assistant, and they were playing a game where they were you know, conversing back and forth, and he managed his ticks very well, and he had a great conversation with my research assistant. So we used to think, and I really did think at one point, that that learning how to manage your ticks was a very, very effortful process, and it required lots of attention and concentration. More recently, we did a little study that seems to suggest that attention and concentration may not be the most important variable. It might actually be verbal uh, uh, intelligence. The way I think about that is verbal intelligence gives us the capacity to learn rules and then use those rules to govern our behavior. And the better you are at learning rules and using, putting rules into practice, which we learn through uh, uh, our vocabulary, uh, the better you are going to be able to uh, use those rules to manage your tick. But what I really tell people now is this doesn't cause, learning to manage your ticks doesn't cause uh, you to be less uh, engaged in your environment. It helps you to be more engaged in your environment. So it's actually, because if you think about what happens for most, most folks with things, is that they're constantly, and I, it's, it's amazing to me, actually, how well people do functionally despite having tics or obsessions, uh, right? Uh, because they're constantly bombarded by irrelevant stimuli that they're attending to as if it is a very important thing to attend to when, in fact, it's not. What's going on around us is the most important, Right? Uh, you know, I, not to not to uh, say that you know my speaking today is all that important, but you know if we're sitting here in the room, you know this information is the most important thing, not the funny thing I get here and here. So I think of ticks as being distracting. 
And I think of the strategies that we teach kids as helping them to get tuned in to their environment. Does this answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can't ask questions. a psychologist. Well, give me other questions, but I'll yeah. wait until okay. you're... Okay. Yeah, you can't I, ask... I think you're going to get to where... I'm sure I will. <laughs> if I don't, please let me know. Sure. Uh, there's also this issue of uh, pandas, and, 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 and uh, what I'll say about it is that there are inconsistent findings. So we really don't know how much of an influence uh, strep has on the development and maintenance and exacerbation of ticks, and, 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 and I just I would ask people to exercise a lot of caution when thinking about the influence of pandas in, in terms of threats, as well as other psychiatric comorbidities like obsessive compulsive disorder. And what I get most concerned about is high-dose antibiotics being used as a frontline treatment. <coughs> Other treatments that we know to be very effective are not utilized uh, because, uh, you know, I worry about uh, kids being then uh, vulnerable uh, to, uh, you know, various uh, 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 infections and, and, and the like as a result of high-dose uh, antibiotics. Uh, I've also uh, heard of some of my patients who have had IBIG, which is essentially... Of, of blood transfusion because they're sick before having behavioral treatment, before having uh, medications, uh, because they had uh, they also had you know a strep at the time when they were evaluated. I also worry uh, to some degree about uh, these experimental treatments uh, because uh, you know I, I I would really prefer that all patients have um, you know uh, access to behavioral treatment, and that's why we're having talks like this. That's why we do trainings around the country. Uh, so that we don't have to resort to things like uh, placing an electrode in a person's brain and a, and a pacemaker at the base of their skull to, to ma manage this when, when we think we can do it effectively with medications uh, and uh, behavioral treatment. Uh, sometimes Botox, I will say, I wouldn't think of this as a frontline treatment for ticks, but sometimes I've had patients that have been benefited by this because it alleviates to some degree those urge experiences. So if you're doing a lot of head and neck movements and you're getting a lot of pain, which is making you do the movements more frequently, Botox might be a way to reduce the, the irritation or your experience of that irritation enough to put you in a good position to learn how to better manage the tick uh, and, and successfully ride out those unpleasant feelings that you have. This shows some promise for trans transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, for various conditions. It's very exploratory at this point, uh, but, it, but it's basically uh, shooting very focused, uh, high intensity uh, uh, electrical impulses through the brain and has, we think, and I'm not an expert in this by any means, but it, we think that it may have some benefit for people with traps. Again, the issue with the medications is side effects. So never take a pill that has more side effects than you have symptoms is the thing that I try to keep in mind. And so when, and, and actually I think things have changed quite a lot with the advent of, of behavioral treatment for ticks so that we're, we're, we, we are using behavioral treatments most of the time for uh, ticks, for ADHD, for o OCD and other anxiety disorders as a frontline treatment more and more often. And I really like to see that because we, we always have to be concerned with side effects for medications. So what's interesting is while we were using medications to treat ticks for a very long time, there was a researcher during that period of time, Nathan Asrin, who's actually a student uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, who's the, who's the uh, famous uh, uh, psychologist who uh, developed operant conditioning principles. Uh, and he, was, he thought, well, you know, I, I know Skinner's doing this with, you know, pigeons and other animals, dogs and the like, but we could apply some of this uh, knowledge that we have regarding how to shape behavior to human beings. And he published a study where, where he had uh, 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 12 people come in, I think they varied quite dramatically in age range, and he gave them these incompatible behaviors that they could do in lieu of ticks and found a dramatic reduction in tick frequency across these 12 subjects. Now, I think what happened is this was published in a behavior, behavioral or, or a psychology journal, and the design didn't fit how medical studies are usually done. Usually we have an active treatment, a placebo uh, treatment, and we're comparing those two things here. We, we, the comparison is you're getting no treatment, and then we give you treatment and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so because it was in a behavioral journal, and because the, the, there was such a dramatic reduction in ticks, I really think that people kind of dismissed this. And that, this is about a 90-some percent reduction in ticks. And I said, how could that be? Yeah. Um, I, I've often thought of, uh, you know, when a tick first initiates, is it, is it um, 
as it goes on? Is there strengthening of neuropathways that makes it more likely to occur? And in behavioral therapy, are you basically just trying to control it long enough so that those neuropathways kind of go away or weaken? Uh, mm-hmm. Is that what's going on, or is that what you're? That's, to a, that's a very good question. So, so what, what I the way I really think about it is there there is a core neurological aspect to ticks. I have no doubt about that. But then what happens is the performing the tick starts to be, become more and more uh, influenced by environmental variables. And what we're doing is we are disrupting this, this kind of cycle uh, and, and shaving off the environmental contributions. And so um, with effective behavioral treatment, people still do have ticks being uh, triggers. Uh, it could, it, well, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment because it, it's, it's actually uh, can be very complicated, but I'm, that's the later part of the, the talk here. But, but the idea is, yes, we think we're giving people verbally mediated rules that disrupt uh, this kind of urge tick cycle, and that what we probably are doing in the context of behavioral treatments is shaving off the environmental influences and keeping it to as, as, as a basic of a condition, a more biological condition, as we can. Make sense? Anyway, so we published in, in 2000, uh, I worked with these wonderful researchers who also worked at the Trek Syndrome Association uh, to, to do the CBIT uh, trial, and we found that it was uh, very effective. Um, we included uh, these red parts are, are the core uh, components that were used in that earlier study, the 1973 Azrin and Nunn study, and then we added psychoeducation, so we gave people information about Tourette's and tick disorders, and then this contingency management and generalization and relapse prevention. These are uh, uh, involve the, the broader environmental influences that I'll get to in a moment, but that you were just alluding to. And so the way I think about it is we give kids these strategies, and it's a, uh, to ride out the urge to perform a tick. And similarly, in, in, with respect to anxiety disorders, the behavioral treatments are, are uh, giving children, or giving anyone who, who, with these conditions, uh, uh, skills to help them to successfully ride out waves, whether it be wave, waves, these waves be urges, or they be uh, hi- hyperarousal associated with um, anxiety. Um, and, and what I, t- I, I, I remind kids is we're not trying to control, this is actually a picture that one of my patients drew for me, because uh, I use this analogy uh, so often. But what I tell people is we're not trying to control ticks. We're trying to gracefully ride out the urge to tick. That's what we're trying to do. Because if you try to control a wave, I don't know if you've ever been out in the ocean and tried to stand up to a wave, try to stand stand firm, uh, it's going to hurt. I'm just telling you. Instead, what we do is we, do, we try to learn how to kind of gracefully let the wave kind of uh, move us a little bit. You know, we might jump off the, the beach, but if we do it in the most graceful way, you know, we're hanging 10. Does that make sense? Um, so we found that essentially, this is the most important number down here, that we, we could reduce uh, ticks by about a third uh, using this behavioral uh, treatment. Um, and and you, you may not think that that's very significant, and it certainly would, would not be uh, something to uh, be too excited about in, in terms of uh, the treatment of cancer, uh, but in, in terms of uh, uh, psychiatric or neuropsychiatric conditions, this is a very good outcome whether we're talking about medications or behavioral treatment. And I think that we actually have learned over time, since we uh, did this study, to do a much better job of helping people to master ticks. And so, so this green line is subthreshold ticks, and, and what you can see is that pre post CBIT, we're getting very close to asymptomatic in the same way as some of these medications do. The great thing about CBIT is about 53% of, uh, of the patients that we saw in the child study were responders, meaning they were either much improved or very much improved. I think that there are really kind of three classes of kids that go through the treatment. The smallest, fortunately, are kids who just don't respond to the treatment very well at all. More often, it's kids uh, are, are, are either partial responders or full responders. Partial responders, well, the way I think about it, is they can manage their ticks when they want to and when they need to, but they don't do it all the time. And when they do use their tick management strategies, they always say it's kind of effortful. And the full responders are kids who manage their ticks here, there, everywhere, day in and day out. And that, that was this uh, group of kids. And these, these kids will say, it just gets easier and easier. But it takes a lot of discipline up front. And, and, uh, and, and, part, and, and I remind people all the time, teaching people that instead of doing this, do this, is not the hard part. That's the what to do, how to get it done. 
is what's much more challenging. Uh, just to, to, to lay any fears, we don't have any evidence to suggest that suppressing one's ticks using these strategies uh, results in a explosion of ticks after you've allowed ticks to occur again. We think it's rebound in the way that a basketball is rebound. So if you just drop a basketball, it bounces once, but not as high as it once was, and then the next time a little bit lower and a little bit lower. That's, that's actually how uh, the, the data we have uh, uh, really kind of look. There, there's not a risk of accidental injury uh, or stomach discomforts. In fact, we found those, and PST is the control condition. So we found that those kids actually had more accidental injury and stomach discomfort than kids who got the active treatment. So what we did is we looked at side effect profiles, and we found that CBIT really doesn't have side effects like medications do. We found that kids that have six months after receiving CBIT, the responders to treatment had less anxiety, less disruptive behavior, less family strain, and less social difficulties. So targeting ticks directly might have some positive uh, benefits uh, more globally for patients. We're now doing a long-term follow-up study. Uh, uh, that's been funded by the Tretz Association, we're very thankful for. We're going to follow up with all the kids who got uh, CBIT originally to see how they're doing. And what the little bit of, um, uh, you don't, don't get too lost in, in this slide here, but basically what we found is that kids that uh, 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 did get the active treatment CBIT uh, were actually, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this, this green, green arteal uh, 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 bar, uh, we're actually, actually sub-threshold now in young adulthood. Now we have to figure out what did they get in between and so forth and so on. But, but it's kind of uh, we're encouraging to see that these kids were actually sub-threshold or asymptomatic, whereas kids got that, that got the, um, the uh, control condition were, were still having uh, some uh, pronounced ticks. So because of CBIT, we now think of there being a, an equally big environmental contribution. By the way, the P here is, is a phenotype. So we have genes and environment, and then we have the phenotypic expression or what you see. And we now think that the environment plays a very large role. Fortunately now, European, Canadian, U.S. guidelines suggest that behavioral treatment is the frontline treatment for ticks. And we're very, very thankful that, that, that this study has had that kind of an impact. Uh, we also know that it's effective for adults. Now, it was, it, our, our data sh has suggested it was maybe not quite as effective for adults. It could be in part because adults that were in the study are those with more persistent ticks. Uh, but it could also be due to the fact uh, that, you know, you know, some of the things that we were, we were doing with kids uh, may, may have had, we, it, it's, it's, you know, adults are a little trickier than kids, right? Uh, and so we, we, we've, we've learned that we probably have to take a little bit different tack in helping adults, but ultimately, I think that adults can benefit from uh, from this treatment uh, just as much as kids if it's done well and in a thoughtful way. We have manuals that have been published in these this treatment that works series. We do a behavioral therapy institute, which a lot of people are going to engage in. We just had one uh, at UCLA um, with a number of clinicians from nurse practitioners to neurologists, psychiatrists, psychologists who are learning how to do this, and so. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're training people to do this, but again, there's still a lot of demand, and and, and, and there's an, we have an underserved population. One of those underserved populations is the littlest kids that were not in our original CBIT trial. I've I've been told by these investigators who who I work very closely with that the results of this trial uh, version for the younger kids is also uh, looking like it's very effective. And in my experience in my clinic, we've used CBIT with kids as young as four, and it does appear to be very effective. Uh, we also have just piloted a two-week treatment, so instead of having ten, um, let's see, eight sessions over the course of ten weeks, so two and a half months, we've put those eight sessions into two weeks, so four sessions a week for two weeks, and we found that we were able to produce, this is not a direct comparison, by the way, but that this intensive treatment at mid-treatment, we might have done slightly better than the more prolonged ten-week treatment, and then uh, at the end of post-treatment, so two weeks versus ten weeks, we may have uh, outperformed that. Now, this is a small study. It's not a direct comparison. This is what we need to do next. But it's very encouraging. And we've, we, last summer, we uh, uh, utilized this two-week intensive treatment. And it's very conducive to training, and, and uh, people like it because you just get kind of in and focused on ticks. can be done over the summer. could be done in the hospital. We're very excited about it. This is my colleague, uh, Mike Kimley, who's at the University of Utah. He and Doug Woods have developed this uh, tick helper, which I believe is still under development, but it's an online interactive resource 
so that you can learn how to manage your ticks in the home. Uh, Dr. Singer uh, and, and I and, and Dr. Uh, Mark Mahone uh, recently got uh, a, a grant from the Tread Association uh, to uh, look at a home-based uh, DVD, so t- uh, a DVD that we're teaching, uh, that we're, we're using to teach parents how to use CBET. Uh, with their child in the home. We're still kind of shooting some segments of that. We'll see how, how that goes. You guys will get a kick out of uh, 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 seeing the final product, I'm sure. Um, uh, but if you're interested in this study, here's some contact information because the other arm is face-to-face treatment. And so some people will get the DVD, some people will get the face-to-face treatment, and we'll see how do they compare. All right. So the bigger, the bigger topic here is anxiety in the context of, uh, uh, of tick disorder. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it turns out that parenting is tough. This is what I remind all my parents. Now, I didn't know this before I was a parent, but now that I'm a parent, I realize that the best case scenario, parenting is very, very hard. This says, now remember, be your, the, the yourself we talked about, right? Is there, uh, the, today, it's kind of crazy. The societal expectations for kids is it, it's a very lofty uh, bar, and as parents, just trying to kind of deal with that, uh, in and of itself, in, in an ideal circumstance where your child is not affected by any sort of psychological, psychiatric, neuropsychiatric, developmental condition, is tough enough. It's just tough enough. But if your child has ticks only, we think that probably you can you can adopt a very low level intervention. And so most people that have ticks, remember I said it's an early onset, mild remitting course. It may not require treatment. We tell people, you know, you have to accept that this is a neuro, neurological or neuropsychiatric condition, and you're, you're, it's okay for your child to tick. Um, we're going to try. We're going to ask parents to try to ignore your your child's tick the best you can. Uh, give give them time to tick. Advocate for them. Support and comfort them, and try to reduce uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to in as minimal a way as possible uh, stress. And your child should do pretty well. The, the, the fact of the matter is, in studies where we have kids with just ticks, they tend to do quite well. It's this issue of comorbidity. And the most common comorbidities being ADHD, OCD, and non-anxiety disorders. As I mentioned before, this is what I spend most of my time treating. I have a lot of people that come to me because of the ticks. And I had a mom in, in, uh, in my office the other day, and I said, I know you think you're here because of the ticks. But her child had co-occurring uh, ADHD, and, and she said, no, 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 I don't think I'm here because of the tick. I know I'm here because of the ticks. And what I'm, tr- what I'm trying to do here today, in part, is to do what I think should be done when you meet with a clinician regarding a child or yourself <coughs> with ticks. Is let's do a thorough evaluation of not only the ticks, but any kind of co-occurring symptoms or conditions you may have, and let's... Let's go come up with a very thoughtful and comprehensive treatment plan so you get all the help that you need. And so when I mention this, mom, I say, you know, uh, you know, your son does have ticks, but most of them I would prioritize below some of these other psychiatric comorbidities, namely uh, ADHD in, in this case. Now, I just wanted to mention just briefly that for ADHD, the combined treatment, so medication, psychostimulants, primarily, uh, and cognitive behavioral therapy called parent management training, is the most effective treatment. We used to say, if you were going to pick one, we would pick med management over behavioral treatment, but there's been a recent study that suggests that in younger kids, we should always start with behavioral treatment before we use the medications, that those kids might do better in the long run than kids who had the medications and then the treatment. Now, I'm not going to go into why that might be, um, uh, but but uh, but just keep in mind, we want to here again ADHD. We want to do behavioral treatment for younger kids who are less uh, severely affected, and then affected, and then we add medications if we need to. For OCD, the combined treatment, both uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Zoloft, and CBT to combine is the best approach. But CBT probably outperforms uh, to a degree uh, uh, the medications as a monotherapy, so we like to do CBT first here as well. If kids have more severe anxiety, they can't participate in treatment, then we add medications. And really the idea for anxiety disorders is if, if a child has an anxiety disorder that co-occurs, uh, we, 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 do, we will treat it first using behavioral treatment. But if uh, we, we are having trouble getting them to participate in treatment because they're going to have to do things that make them feel uncomfortable and anxious, then we might use a medication 
And if you go back to my wave analogy, it's kind of like trying to reduce the size and amplitude of the waves a little bit so somebody has a chance of learning how to surf, right? If you try to learn how to surf a 15-foot wave, believe me, I, I know from first-hand experience, you're going to do a lot of riding up the beach on your face, right? And you're going to say, surfing's not for me. But if we can reduce the amplitude uh, and the frequency of the waves, you you got a chance. And you might say, you know what, I can do this. Does that make sense? Uh, this is a CD response rate. For other anxiety disorders, we found that the combined approach is better than CBIT, which is maybe about uh, in, in uh, non-OCD anxiety disorders about the same as uh, as medication. But again, behavioral treatment first. Add medications if we need to. Okay, so here's the main uh, thrust of the of the talk here. The, uh, I like to think of patients that uh, that come to my clinic. So these are the kids who usually do have some co-occurring psychiatric symptoms and conditions as knuckleball pitchers. And I don't know how familiar you are with baseball, but knuckleball pitchers throw a pitch. I, I remember the first time I saw a knuckleball pitcher. It was Tim Wakefield, who played for the Boston Red Sox. He was playing the Orioles. And he, he would stand on the mound, and he would wind up, kind of half, uh, you know, wind up, really. And he would, without any effort, kind of lob the ball across the plate. And I thought, I can throw the ball harder than this guy can. And he struck batter after batter after batter out. And it's because while the pitch goes about the, a half the speed of a fastball, it's moving through the air in a very unpredictable way. And so people have a lot of trouble hitting it. What happens to batters, and batters are, in, in, here, in this case, are, are the parents, is that you start adopting unorthodox attempts to hit the ball, right? And meanwhile, you don't know it, but you're moving further and further away from moving the ball because you think you should do something different when, in fact... The same principles that work uh, uh, to, to, to hit, hit a, a, a fastball also work here. You just have to be very expert and very disciplined. And that's what we do in the context of our clinic, primarily, is to help parents to acknowledge that, remember, parenting is tough to begin with, but in, in your case, it's going to be, if your child has one condition, just text, it's going to be a lot more challenging. If they have multiple conditions, it's going to seem impossible and our job is to help you to realize that what seems impossible is actually possible, and we're going to work together to do that. And so I like this cartoon about family accommodation, because what happens with anxiety disorders and tick disorders and, and how parents kind of uh, adjust and teachers and school administrators or adjust uh, their interactions with patients is by uh, 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 accommodating. So when somebody's struggling in our, in our society, we give them the sick role. So we... We don't hold them to the same expectations that we do other people. The problem is, is funny things start to happen uh, uh, like this. This, is, uh, this says down here, as, as little, the, the child here is looking at the TV, please turn, turn it down, Daddy is trying to do your homework. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thing that we have seen in, in our clinic. And it starts in a very innocent way. And next thing you know, these kinds of things happen. And, and what happens then is, unintentionally, symptoms and dysfunction rather than symptom management and functional ability or capacity is rewarded inadvertently. Right? I mean, if your parent's doing your homework, right, uh, because you're having lots of symptoms, what's inadvertently happening is that your symptoms are being reinforced. This is another example. This is an actual child that we had that had a shirt that said it's Tourette's. And he would, he would if, if he was having tics and sitting in my waiting room and somebody would look at him and kind of, uh, you know, wonder what's going on, he would say, right? This is another accommodation, right? We, we need to give people better strategies as clinicians to deal with these conditions than a shirt that explains what the condition you have is. Here's an education accommodation. So I, I think it's great that people are educated about Tourette's and tick disorders and the co-occurring psychiatric conditions in life. But the thought of having a child going around giving someone a card that says, here's what's going on with me, uh, is, is, is concer concerning to me because what can happen is, and this is actually the same child, what can happen is that simple accommodation in people who are very well-intended can can be inadvertently, in a very dramatic way, <laughs> reinforcing symptoms and dysfunction. So this, this special room, now thankfully, uh, this is a really wonderful family. They came in and they said, look at this special room we have. We're giving out this card and some on. And I said, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, she hasn't used the room yet. and She's not really handing out the cards. And I said, well, I don't like it. We're going to have to give you a better way. And I thought that they would 
pushed back about, uh, on that. And they said, okay, good, thank goodness we didn't. Well, what are we going to do? Because what, what the plan was, was if she was having lots of ticks in the classroom, it, and which were, were oftentimes precipitated by stress and anxiety about test taking and like, then she would go to the special room that has a computer, it's got a little flower, it's got these posters and everything, right? And she could take, so she wouldn't be alone, she could take her bestie, and this was in the teacher's, uh, in the teacher's lounge, right? And, and so you can't see here is I think there was a little bean bag here for the bestie to sit in. And so if you're having lots of symptoms of dysfunction, you can go to the teacher's lounge into your special room and kick back and, you know, have a nice time, right? Now, I, I have no problem with that. I'd like kids to have access to those things. But what we did is we said, if we're going to do this, I'm, we can do it. But she's going to earn it through managing her symptoms well in the classroom. That's how we do it. And they said, oh, well, that makes sense. Because what I worry about is kids becoming famous because they have ticks. That now Tim Howard here, he was famous because he had ticks. But boy, if you saw him in that, in that game uh, in the uh, I think it was the World Cup or the Olympics, I can't remember maybe the Olympics. But I mean, I don't, I don't even know how many uh, balls he stopped from getting in the net. But he was amazing. He, yes, he has ticks, but he's an amazing goalie. That's what he's famous for now. Dear parents, uh, I always remind parents, listen, we can't have any blame. So I am saying that the things that we do as parents and teachers might inadvertently reinforce symptoms, but you cannot blame yourself because blame is, is going to do no good for anybody. We can't blame teachers, we can't blame parents, we can't blame kids, we can't blame ourselves. We just have to say we can do better, and, and that's what we're going to aim to do. Right. So I don't want anybody walking away today saying, boy, he's saying that somehow parents are great. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it's a very, very challenging situation. And without knowing what to do and how to get it done, without some expert consultation, uh, you're, up, uh, you're up against a very difficult challenge. So here are the major issues impacting quality of life. For many of my patients when they come in because they haven't had a comprehensive evaluation, they haven't had a discussion about a comprehensive treatment plan, is misinformed treatment uh, decision making. In other words, we've, we've had um, patients who have lots of psychiatric comorbidities that are actually causing a lot more problems than are the ticks, but, but the doctors and, and are, are chasing the ticks. They're trying to, to, to get rid of the ticks, thinking that if I get rid of the ticks, all these other great things are going to come. And, and, it, and we would actually say you probably, in most cases, want to target these other symptoms and conditions uh, first. Ignoring the influence of comorbidity. So I remember a good example of this. I had a patient, young lady, uh, probably about 16 years old. She said, listen, Dr. Speck, I, I have these ticks, and, and i got to get rid of them. I said, I, I know, but I, you know, my evaluation would suggest you also have social anxiety disorder. And she said, no, 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 it's just because of the ticks. Get rid of the ticks, and you'll see I'll be a social butterfly. And by golly, I treated the ticks, and she was a social butterfly for about two weeks. And then she said, I think my freckles make me look weird. <laughs> and then she started to have, you know, some anxiety about that. So, so my point here is that these comorbidities can make ticks more problematic. Yeah. I'm sorry. Keep taking more time. Uh, that was great. The um, so uh, enabling enabling kids to in their learning process. Uh, a couple slides back. What would you? Cons I, I always look at um, accommodations as being you're walking a fence. You know, you, you want your kids off the accommodations. But at the same time, you want them to have them if they need them. Uh, what would be, and I always see myself as being sort of the firewall in terms of OCD. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be reason? How do you how do you get off that fence? If or what should you look to? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about that. And one of the things I will just say, and I and I, and I understand the, your use of the term. You're 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 using the, you use the term enabling. I don't know if you were aware that you use that. Yes, I, I like I use accommodation because enabling to me suggests that I'm I'm, I'm intentionally doing something that I know uh, is not good, but I'm well, but I'm doing it anyway. And it's an unconscious enabling. Right. I think in most cases. I, I think most of the time, it, or or it's expedient in terms of the school system and, and right and as parents. That's right. So I think most of the time, you know, again, I, I we, we don't want to get anybody into the business of blaming themselves, yeah. blaming yeah. other right. people. So I, so I say, hey, you know, you're doing it. I tell people this all the time, and believe me, it's true. Uh, I believe that my patients and their families will and do better if they know how to. And that I've never been proven wrong on that, right? If they know how to do better, 
They will. There's just a natural tendency, especially for kids. I mean, kids are amazing. I mean, they, if, if you give them a way to do better, they will, right? Uh, the problem is, is that it's very complicated trying to see through everything in order to give them the way uh, to, to, to do better. And I tell parents all the time, listen, if I were in your shoes, I would be doing the same thing. I would have the same tendency to accommodate for expediency for other reasons that you are. So, you know, we just have to accept that anybody would be doing what you're doing if you had these funny sensations and experiences. Any, anybody would be doing, you know, tics, uh, performing tics with a certain rate. If, if, if people were having this hyper... Uh, hyper arousal because they touched something that was kind of weird on the surface and, and, and thought that they were you know, being contaminated uh, by, by something that might kill them, they, yeah, I'd be washing my hands quite a lot too, right? So, so the, the idea here is anybody would be doing what, what people with these, uh, with these conditions is doing if they were having the same experiences, and their, their families would be too. We just have to give them a better way. Does that make sense? And, yes, and the, the trick, I think, to the cognitive behavioral therapy is the, the the techniques you give them is to be able to employ them in in the in your you know you make your battle plan and then you go in and things kind of uh, well, you know, well are right forward. so so I'm, I'm gonna get to that okay. in a this week. so um, again f- uh, failure to utilize the combined treatment approach when it's necessary ignoring what's known to work and, and doing and doing things that are experimental as a first step and then receiving CBT I, I call this cult bunk tutelage which is just uh, you know. Uh, uh, I always worry when I see people say I'm, a, I'm an eclectic cognitive behavioral therapist because cognitive behavioral therapy gives us very good principles to follow to help people. And when people are doing an eclectic thing, usually what, what I'm concerned about is they're doing whatever kind of you know, method that they've learned at the most recent you know, uh, conference without really having a good theoretical framework for it. So CBT is uh, that we see a lot in the community is not actually what I would consider CBT. So let me just point this out quickly. So for, for kids who are really struggling a lot or making it to the emergency room and the inpatient, you know, the first step is to stabilize. We don't start targeting those disorder-specific symptoms. We, start, we have to stabilize them and stabilize the environment. So we work from the outside in. Then we start to address these environmental contingencies that are inadvertently reinforcing symptoms. And so we try to figure out creative ways to help parents, teachers, schools to redistribute the reinforcers to uh, symptom management and functional capacity and away from symptoms and dysfunction, which is usually at a higher level of care when kids are struggling more, what's, what's happened in a very big way. Then we want to improve functioning, whether you have tics only or you have an anxiety disorder only. <laughs> I'm, I'm focused more on functioning, getting you to be able to do things more and more independently uh, and more and more reliably. And then, we're, uh, if we do our job right, then we are in a good position to use treatments to target disorder-specific symptoms. Um, and so with, with this, we take a strengths-based approach. So, so initially, when we were having more and more com- uh, complicated patients coming in, we were trying to use these targeted interventions. And believe me, there are times where that is the most appropriate thing to do, is to use a targeted intervention, even in more complex kids. But, but making that decision... Uh, without, we don't have good literature on how to do that. You have to have a lot of experience. More often, what we found is we can't uh, expect that kids are going to be able to expertly manage symptoms and that their parents are, are going to be able to help them to do that if the world is upside down, that symptoms and dysfunction are what garner the most reinforcement. We have to, first of all, get the, get the world kind of right side up here, which is, uh, uh, to create an environment that rewards kids uh, for um, uh, symptom management and, and, and functional capacity. And so, and then over time we help them to stress-proof their tick management and we, 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 we expose them to, uh, to stressors in the later stages of treatment. This is, I've decided to work from home today. So remember that, you know, uh, these are uh, um, uh, some things that will get shaped up in kids is, is that because of all of these symptoms I have, that are exacerbated by all sorts of environments like school, the way I think about it as a kid is the best way to deal with this situation is just to avoid those situations altogether. Uh, the problem is, is that that creates a fertile ground for the symptoms to grow. And uh, we've had kids who don't leave their house because of ticks. More so because of anxiety about ticks, by the way. 
Uh, what I remind people is the only thing worse than no CBT is bad CBT. And, and we actually know that inexpert CBT is a reason for treatment failure, and I really worry about uh, bad CBT because it can actually make kids treatment resistant now to the front line and one of the most effective treatments, whether it's for tics or anxiety disorders or ADHD, whatever the case is. If it's, if it's not by an expert uh, uh, person uh, who really knows what they're doing, we have had, I have had kids come to my office who say, I don't like you. And I said, oh, you look me up online, oh, I'm kind of a weird looking guy, but you know, I'm, I, I promise you, I'm really nice. And they said, no, I just don't like your type. And I, I, I you, you know, somebody like you has done things to me that has, that I've not liked at all. And I said, well, you know, and I hear horror stories about things that have happened. So inexpert CBT is a, is a real problem. So this is what happens a lot of times, I fear, in the community which is uh, the, uh, the therapist is focused on creating temporary changes in cognitions, and there might be a temporary change in behavior. So they sit down with the child, and they say, hey, you know, I don't think you should be worried about that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not a big deal. You're, you're fine. You're a great kid. This is supportive psychotherapy. It's like you have an anxiety disorder. Here's how anxiety disorders work. You're a great kid. Just go to school. And then the kid leaves, and then the parents are sitting out in the waiting room, and the child comes out, and the parents go, so, what did, what did the doctor say? And you know what, boys, so about you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, say, uh-huh. uh-huh. Right? Well, so then what happens is the children go back to the same old environment, and then it's a resumption of old behaviors because those are the behaviors that are reinforced in the environment. And then we have uh, this kind of uh, reemergence of the same old cognitive set. Right? I have an anxiety disorder. I can't go to school. Right? I have ticks. I can't go out in public. Right? Um, so the way I like to explain this to people is cognitive behavioral therapy, where we're talking about ticks or anxiety source, whatever, it's small c in most cases. It's small c. Cognitive, or the C in CBT cognitive, is thinking. The B, notice here it's bigger, is behavior, and, uh, behavioral, and that's doing. And the biggest thing is T, which is changing. Now... <laughs> Now, believe it or not, so, so I kind of prioritize them this way. Small c, big b, but the biggest thing that we're doing is trying to change. And it turns out that people come into my office quite regularly, and, and they expect that I'm going to do something. I, I don't know exactly what. I don't think they know exactly what. To, to affect change in, in, in the, the affected person. Um, and, and then I said, well, we're going to have to change the way we're doing things. And they go, oh, no, no, not that. As, as if sometimes people come into my office expecting that I'm going to say, you know what, what you're doing is working perfectly, even though we know it's not, and you don't have to do anything differently. So the change in is the important piece, and, and it's my role or the role of any good CBT or psychologist to uh, help uh, parents make changes in the environment that will support kids to uh, symptom management and uh, norm. So parents, uh, this, this slide's kind of busy, but mm-hmm. the important point here is that parents are the active agreement, agree, ingredient in cognitive behavioral therapy, okay? And here's why. So what I really think happens in cognitive behavioral therapy is we temporarily change cognitions. I, I hope I'm doing that here today. And then there will be a ch- temporary change in behavior. But if we make environmental modifications, which we do through parents, uh, then those new behaviors are more likely to occur. So going back to your question, how do you walk that line? Well, you know, we, I, I remember thinking of one of my patients, um, uh, and he was in the office with, with his mom, and she said he's, he's avoiding school because of his anxiety. And I said, well, you know, it, it's fine uh, if he doesn't want, makes the decision that he doesn't want to go to school. Uh, and she said, what? I said, yeah, that's a, that's a viable option. I mean, if you're feeling anxious, you know, you don't have to go to school. But if you do go to school, there's, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna densely reinforce you for doing that. Right, and so he, I remember him looking at me, thinking I could could tell he was thinking. I think I'm going to see if my mom will follow through on this. I don't have to go if I don't want to. And she did. So the next, within a couple of days, he woke up in the morning and said, "I'm not feeling well. My tummy hurts. I I'm, I feel short of breath, and I want to stay home." And the mom said, "Okay." And she called her employer and said, "Hey, I'm sorry, my son's sick. I'm going to stay home." And then she uh, did what was appropriate, was which was to put him in a neutral environment. There's nothing reinforcing here. He's going to be in bed, shades drawn, <laughs> lights off, no TV, no electronics. You know, you get your 7-Up your or your ginger ale and some crackers. 
And so he tolerated that through the whole school day. And then when school got done, he said, hey, all my friends are back, and I'm feeling a lot better. And she said, well, you know, you better still get your rest. Because, you know, I don't want you to get, you know, worn down and have all that reemerge. And so he ended up being in bed for the rest of the day. The next morning, he woke up and said, I don't feel very good. My stomach feels a little bit upset. Uh, I, I don't, I, and she said, oh, so do you need to stay home again today? And he said, oh, no, 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 I think I, uh, I think I'll, um, I think I'm going to go uh, to school. And we had arranged it in such a way that if he makes the choice that is good for him, he's going to get densely reinforced. If he has symptoms and, as a result, is having some functional problems, fine. But we're not going to reward that. We're going to put that in a neutral environment, right? We have an enriched environment that's going to school. We're going to make it very densely reinforcing for you. And uh, we're going to have a neutral environment. Go ahead. I mean, one of the things I usually do with my students is we have a sensory calm-down room that we use. We don't use, like, you know, reinforcers, just like it's an empty room. With a beanbag chair, they can sit in and take what they need to without hurting themselves. Yeah. And usually I'll set a timer, say 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes are up. Are you ready to go back and get, you know, mm-hmm. and let their friends cheer them up when they get back? Yeah. Whatever. But right. it's. Right. That, that is very consistent with this kind of neutral environment. And, and what I would suggest is that if, if a child needs to go to the neutral environment because they're having symptoms and dysfunction, great. But if I'm going to use a timer, I'm going to create an incentive for you to get your symptoms under control and back in the classroom faster. right? So I'll set a timer, and let's see how good you can do of using the strategies maybe that you've learned in treatment. So again, the important part here is you have to have strategies. You have to have, it's not a stop it, stop doing your tics. It's a, here's what to do instead. That's what you get in treatment. And we're going to create an incentive for, yes, you can use that room, absolutely. But the faster you get your symptoms out under control and get in the classroom, or the more time you spend in the classroom, the more reward you're going to get. Right? Yeah. So as you know, as a, that's for for a younger child strategy for a younger child, and as you either an adult or an older child, I, you, you become in control of that sort of thing yourself, I would guess, and and uh, you know, creating those those two environment those environments uh, would be I. I think that's where I'm, my, my son is a little old, he's uh, 16, and uh, so for him to create those states himself is, is kind of, uh, rather than having me create those states for him, yeah, uh, is, is the difficulty, I guess. Right. Uh, you, you, you know, I was recently talking uh, to, to Dr. DePaulo, who's been our chairman in the uh, 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 psychiatry here at Johns Hopkins for a very long time. Uh, he, he's, he's recently uh, stepped down and we have an interim chair. Uh, and he said, you know, I still remember when we, when we did grand rounds together here, and that was maybe four or five years ago, and he said, you brought that patient in, and I was asking the patient about, you know, didn't Dr. Speck help you with your, because uh, Dr. DePaul actually interviews patients in front of all the doctors, uh, you know, are right up there on stage, which is really pretty unique. <laughs> He said, you know, didn't Dr. Speck help you manage ticks and so forth and so on? And I didn't know this, but my, my, um, my, the two parents and my patient had decided that they wanted everybody to know that that's not how I helped them. That the way I helped them was to develop strategies for interacting with, with one another around anything. So that the parents could say, hey, you got choices, buddy. You know, you're 16 years old. You can make a lot of different choices. But we think these are better choices for you, and so we're going to create an incentive for you to make those choices. Now, if you don't want to, that's fine. Now, what they actually came in with is this whole elaborate thing. They did an excellent job of presenting it to us, is around driving the car. He had certain behavioral expectations that he needed to do with enough frequency and regularity and independence that would allow him minutes with the car, gas for the car, and so forth and so on. Right? And if he didn't want to do those things that mom and dad wanted to do, that's fine, but he can't use the car. Right? They learned that, I remember, because he came in one day, I didn't see them for a while, and the, and the parents and, and, and this young man came in when he, when he was in high school, and he's sitting like this, and the parents are saying, they said, we got a major issue to talk about. He said, well, what, what's the major issue? Uh, and they said, uh, he said, he piped up, he said, well, I, I'm not taking AP classes anymore. And I said, you're not taking AP classes? No, I said, it's just too much stress, and I'm just not doing it. I'm not taking any AP classes, and they think that I'm going to take AP. I'm not taking AP classes, and then it you know, kind of erupted in a little discussion there. And what I said is, you know, it turns out 16-year-olds you know, are more, much more concrete than we give them credit for. 
And I, you know, I'm much older than 16, and I'm more concrete than I give myself credit for. Believe me, I think I'm a lot smarter than I am, right? But, but it turns out that experience is, is probably the most important thing for all of us. And that's why behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy is not just about thinking in a different way. It's about doing those things with enough regularity. So what we said is, listen, remember when he was littler, we did a behavioral plan. We had a token economy. You do the things that we think are in your best interest. You get more rewards. If you don't do them, you're in a neutral environment. And if you do a small subset of things that are just absolutely unacceptable, like punching your brother, then you're going to get the time out which is uh, it, it removing you from the access to reinforcement, right? Three different environments. So the parents did here uh, in therapy, and, and they had kind of come along far enough that when we talked about it, they said, oh, yeah, this makes sense. So they said, you do what you want. You pick which classes you want to take, AP and not AP, but here's how we're going to do it. If you get an A in an AP class, any A, bring home any A, 15 bucks. You get a B, 10, right? You get a C, 8. Okay. Regular ed classes, you bring home any grade, you get an A, we'll give you nine. Right? You get a B, we'll give you five. You get a C, we'll give you three. This young man said, okay, I, hey, I like this. I, I, I understand. You know, it's concrete. You, you're telling me what you think about this. And then he made a decision that was in very much in his best interest. He took one regular ed class and the rest AP classes, which is all he really wanted in the first place. So my point is, is, we try to use in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy to help parents, help schools, even help kids to understand that, you know, you can do everything that everybody else can do despite the fact that you have these conditions, and that's really remarkable, right? I mean, uh, when I talk about a strength-based approach, the first thing that we do is when kids come in, you know, I was getting to that. Uh, let me get to this. So I've talked about these environments, but the, the first thing that we do is we say, okay, we've got to do some psychoeducation, then we have, to, we have to help you to know how to manage crises in case they emerge, okay? But then what we do is we identify the adaptive pro-social behaviors kids are already displaying. And then we try to make sure that those behaviors are occurring with a lot of regularity, like at 80% or better, usually more like 90%. And then we take the rewards, usually in the form of allowance and screen time, and we redistribute them to those behaviors that kids are already displaying. You can, I'm embarrassed about this, but, but it, it taught me uh, uh, that we needed to do a better job. If you look online and Google me, you'll see where a mom says, hey, my child has ticks. This is from years ago. Where should we go? And another mom said, take him to Dr. Sprague at Johns Hopkins. He'll, he knows what to do. And another mom came out and said, don't take your child to that awful man. Because if he, if he gets old to your kid, here's what he's going to do. If, if you do a good job managing your ticks, you get a reward. If you don't, then you get nothing. Right? <laughs> and now that's not true. That's not what we do at all. But that was their experience of it. And it just re it reinforced for me that we need to do a good job of saying, hey, look at These children are compromised. Their development is compromised because of these conditions. And yet they're doing a remarkable <laughs> job. Right? So when parents come in, I, I'm asking them to first identify, what is your child doing that we like and we can be proud of as functional and adaptive? And let's start rewarding the heck out of that. And believe, yes? And I would, I would guess eventually, as an older child or adult, your, your rewards are recognized by your, your self-esteem, your uh, feeling of, of, of accomplishment, and that sort of thing that you're associating with these uh, I think that that comes later. I'll, I'll tell you a personal example. So I went to my uh, my uh, my uh, my general practitioner, and you know I had my yearly physical, and he kind of looked at my you know blood work. And he said, hey, "It's looking pretty good." Whoa! Except for your uh, your cholesterol is starting to creep up. I said, "Oh yeah, but, but but that's mostly genetic, right?" So you know I got family history, and so we're saying, "He said, yeah, but there's things you can do about it." I said, "Well, what?" He said, well, uh, exercise. And I told him my exercise regimen very proudly. And he said, hey, that's very good. Keep doing that. And I said, what else? And he said, diet. And I said, oh, okay. And I was expecting that I was going to get, you know, this weird, like a, you're, I'm going to set you up with a dietitian and stuff. And he said, it's pretty simple. You're a smart guy. More salads, fewer steaks. Okay. And so I went, I, I made mean, literally in his office, I was sitting there. And I had a temporary change in my cognition. And I was sitting there in his office going, of course. Of course, salads. I love salads. I mean, I always think that I'm not going to want a salad because it's not going to be filling. And, and you know, but I, I'm, I'm basically Mr. Salad now, 
Like, that's not, that's just what I'm going to do. I'm just going to eat salads, right? Thanks a lot, Doc. And I kid you not, my wife worked at that hospital. I walked downstairs, and she said, do you want to go to lunch? I said, yeah, I want to go to lunch. And I walked in, I saw the salad bar, and then I smelled the grill, <laughs> right? And you know what I did. I mean, I was very well intended, and it would be very gratifying for me to have made that change in behavior, right? But you know I chose that burger. But I, I did get a tomato and lettuce on it, so, so that's kind of like a salad, right? But, but in order for me, and my wife now actually works for um, a health insurance company, and they try to create incentives for patients to do what's in their best interest, just like we've been talking about here. So what do you think would happen if I do, because I do choose salads, if somebody from my insurance company magically appeared and said, hey, good choice, here's 20 bucks, right? You know I'd be eating more salads. You know I would. And then, if you eat enough salads, you become, you become like one of my good friends who has once ate steak for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And now, if I'm eating meat, he says, oh my gosh, that's cruelty to animals. What are you doing to the environment? Right? Now, he has a lasting change in his cognitions because he has engaged in this new behavior through his vegetarian diet for, with enough regularity that he likes it. And he, ha he has a whole new way of looking at the world because of this new behavior. But really, truly, I tell people this all the time, I'm an expert in human behavior, and what I'll tell you is you can't change other people's behavior. You can barely change your own. But if the environment, and I'm speaking from personal experience, but if the environment is conducive to you engaging in the better behaviors with more regularity, you will start to do that. And if you do it with enough frequency, you will then have the experience of this is better. Does that make sense? So I'm always, as a psychologist, it's not about what to do, it's about how to get it done. And how to get it done is very tricky. And, and most, most of my uh, uh, families, when I start talking about, okay, we're going to develop a behavior plan, I said, where are you? We had a board, and we had, here's the things he's going to do, and he's going to get stickers, and it doesn't work. And I said, oh, well, you know, uh, you know I, I'm sorry, but I beg to differ with you. Now, who was the expert you were working with to develop this plan? And they say, we, 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 we read a book, and, and we looked it up online. I said, well, that, that you know, with, with the kind of most pedestrian child, that will probably work okay. But if you're going to do it in a more, uh, more complicated uh, situation, you need to have expert consultation. And the focus of the treatment should help you to become an expert. That's what this family was telling our chairman was, no, no, no. Yes, he helped us manage chicks, but that, you know, that's fine. But what he really did is help us how to expertly shape our child's behavior <laughs> over time, whether it be ticks or anxiety, uh, uh, you know, uh, behaviors related to anxiety, or, or uh, you know, choosing his classes or, or going to school. That's the idea here. Does it make sense? Yes. Um, yeah. No. Number three, identify adaptive pro-social behaviors. I would expect that for, for individual children, um, incentives are different. Uh, I know with our kids, a lot of things, they were just not incentivized by things that... Yeah. Reinforcers are very individualistic. But the two things that I've noticed that are, are, are most common is, uh, uh, you know, actually I've had a lot of kids <coughs> come into treatment expecting this really kind of gruesome thing that I'm going to be involved in, and this doctor's going to be mean. And I've had kids actually say, you know what, you're my favorite doctor. Because I say, hey, let's list all the things that your kid's already doing that we like, and let's tie... Um, allowance and screen time to those behaviors. And the kid goes, I I've never had an allowance before. And I said, well, you're going to get one now, right? And you're going to get an allowance for all the right stuff. And I tell parents, listen, you have a lot of discretionary spending, right? And, and you can, you know, your kids want to use screen time all the time. You can hold that in reserve and allow them to earn it through doing the things that they're going to need to grow up to be an independent, fully functioning, happy, healthy, productive adult. And then you get to the satisfaction of watching them enjoy those things while having also the knowledge that they learned something. They learned something about managing their symptoms. They learned something about their capacities, right? They learned something about how capitalism, the real world that we live in, works. All those things. And they learned that they can do this. Right? So, so the reason we use allowance and screen time is I don't know what you want to use screen time for. If you want to use it for Netflix or you want to use it for video games, I don't know what you're going to use your allowance for. If you're going to learn, use it for a G.I. Joe or a crab cake sandwich, and you all should have a crab cake down here before you go. Right? Uh, so then we, then we implement the behavioral plan in the token economy, 
because we want people to do these things first. Let's reinforce kids. And then we talk about, let's do a timeout procedure for a very small